One Education is sponsored by Participate, a community learning platform where the world learns together. Later in the episode, we'll hear about one of Participate's partners, The Sandbox, and how you can get involved in its free community learning opportunities and live streams. There is like there are two kinds of listeners to this show, by the way, and they are defined by their reaction to that sentence. Yeah, yeah, there yeah, is, yeah. There is half of the audience that said, I have no idea what three quarters of those words <laughs> meant, and why do I listen to this show? <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 200 of the On Education Podcast. I am your newest co-host, Brad Schreffler, and I am joined by my bald-like-an-old-person co-host, Mike Washburn. Oh, so <laughs> extra. On the podcast today, we talk about some show updates. Shockingly, video games come up, the desperate teacher shortage and why it exists, the future of Peloton and gaming, and our guest this week is games and education expert, Zach Hartsman. I'm leaving it in. I'm, I'm allowing it. We're going to tweak it, but that was way too extra for me, I just, man. I just really wanted to say my old, like, a, or bald, like an old person co-host You're after Jacob's conversation. You're channeling five-year-old. <laughs> that was really what I was going for. That was it. <laughs> I love it. Well, welcome to Brad's first episode. Um, episode 200, holy crap. Um, all happening at the same time. I don't know if I can handle it all. We took a, we took a break because schedules. Do not align. You guys went places because in America they go places now. Well, you know, I I don't. I'm a 12 month employee now, so I get like one week a year I get to travel again. So I'm having to get right. used to the normal working life. Glenn went to California. Glenn went all over the place. He went to California and, then he, and, and then the Dakotas and like right. Was... And then he went to South Dakota, population the Irvings. Yeah, that's it. That's it. So it doubles the, every time. It's like he Glenn, goes in Glenn there. Irvin and family <laughs> um, are the population of North Dakota with his in-laws, I guess. So, um, yeah, we you know we tried to do a roundtable even for episode two hundred. We had a had an idea and no one was around. Everyone's on vacation. It's the middle of the summer, I guess. Um, and and so this is episode two hundred. Where it, it is great, um, and I'm and I'm really excited that Brad's here. I was thinking, Brad, as we were getting set up here that, you know, Glenn and I, it was a crapshoot. Like, I didn't know Glenn hardly at all when we started the podcast. And I actually feel like I know you a decent amount. Like, I mean, we talk outside of, we've played games together at night and we've hung out uh, in person, um, you know, uh, at conferences. And it's, and it's, this is interesting. This is neat. Um, I'm really excited uh you know that this is the first episode and we just did an inter we just had our first interview with uh with zach yeah, right I mean, it was it was above average as you it told was. me it was above average so that's <laughs> good was, i'm excited i think i i actually also said it's it was not mediocre it yeah, was it go. was better than <laughs> mediocre so that's good no it was great hey listen oh wow synergy there you'll hear why later i guess i've been watching this show that I think every teacher should watch, especially every K to like five teacher should watch this show called Taskmaster. It's it's on you. Every episode is on YouTube for free. It's a British show. You put um, this in the notes and I was like, I fully expected this to be like some sort of on air subtle cue for me to do more work. <laughs> like, no, I no, just, no, no, no. It just says Taskmaster. And I'm like, oh, Mike's going to be a Taskmaster. That's where no, we're going. I'm, <laughs> I'm telling you, this is a show. <laughs> And it's a game. It's kind of like a game show, but but not. But it is. Um, and it's British, so it's got like very British humor in it. But it's so good. And the 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 object of the show is is there's a panel. They're on for a whole season. There's five comedians, celebrities, whatever. And then Greg Davies, the comedian Greg Davies, is an English guy, is the host of the show. And he and the co-host. Um, um, I can't remember his name. Uh, uh, Alex Horn is the co-host. And they get the five panelists to do, like, weird or hard things. And then the best people to perform those tasks wins points. And then they do four or five tasks every episode and, and whatnot. But the, but the tasks, Brad, are so great that I, I sit there and I'm watching them and I've watched, there's there's 12 seasons of this show. 
So I've watched nine. We just finished season nine today. And I sit there and I watch them do these tasks. And I'm going, this would be so awesome for like a... You know those days that you would have at an, a, at an elementary school? I don't know how far removed you are from stuff like that. But but like I taught in elementary school and we used to have these like Olympics type days where where the, we'd put on like some stuff in the gym and we'd have stuff in the field and we'd have stuff on the on the on the on the pavement and kids would rotate in groups and teams and they do all these weird tasks. Right. Um, events. And and that would be like an Olympic day, Woo, like a field day. School. Field day, yeah. Right, sure. Actually, not not untrue. I think that's pretty much what the actual Olympics are going to look like this year. Oh, but the Olympics like... are a dumpster fire. That's a whole <laughs> different topic. Um, but these tasks would be so awesome for that. That I'm dying for teachers to watch this show and agree with me and go, oh my god, I am using the Taskmaster tasks at school. It sounds um, like as you're describing it, like minute to win it, like this is the British version of minute to win it. But I, I it, maybe it's like, are they different? What are the ta- give an example of a task? So so <laughs> the the first task is always the funniest. Now, this is the one that's least related to school. But um, but the, the first task of the show is always where the, the guests, the five panelists have to bring in something. And it's always there's a criteria. So um, the best slippery thing. Right, it's an example. That would so be they, really. They, they, you could they, do this in elementary, but that would be the stopgap for that game. Right, Just like, right. Nope. So they had to bring in the best slippery thing, or or like they have to bring in the thing that will change their life the most in the best way. This is the thing that will change Greg Davies's life the most in the best way because he's the judge, the judge of the show. Right. So, but that's like the other tasks are things like. Um, run as far as you can while making a noise constantly. Okay. So you have to, you know, go go the longest distance while making a noise. Okay. And so they, they, but they're hilarious, right? Because first off, the, the thing, like there's a magic sauce to it. They're comedians, right? So right. they're funny and they're naturally hilarious and they're very improvisational and they do a lot of, of stupid stuff. But it's uh, it's a hell of a show, man. And I think you should watch it. And I think Glenn should watch it, and I think everyone listening should watch it. And then let's talk about Taskmaster, because uh, I'm down with it. <laughs> I was going to say, I think the real moral of this section of the show is you just want to talk about this show with more people. I do. I do. I do. <laughs> um, another thing I actually want to talk to more people about is Dune. I, I bought Dune, the books. Okay. There's six of them, apparently. I didn't even know this. Yeah, yeah it's a whole thing. It's a whole series. So the, yeah, there's probably like literature people just screaming yeah. at me right yeah. now. They're real not happy about it. <laughs> it's only going to get worse because I'm about to say something. I could not get through the first book, and this was recently. Like really? I couldn't. I tried to do the audio book. We did it for a book club pre-pandemic with some friends, yeah. and uh, nah, couldn't get through. It was actually the end of the book club. It ended the book club. We were done. <laughs> Dune was so bad, the book club ended. Yeah, no one could get through it. They couldn't get through it. Oh, now, I don't know that we rough. gave it a fair shot. I tried to listen to it with my wife in a car. Like, it probably wasn't... Which, like, I've listened to a lot of great books that way. I love audiobooks with my wife. But it was not a good book for her, so I probably should have given it a shot on my own. Maybe I'll go back to it. But it just... There's a lot of names. It kind of struggles with the same problem, in my opinion, that um, Game of Thrones has as a book. Sure, okay. Like, Lots of people. There's just so many names. And yeah. hearing them, they aren't quite as differentiated as reading them, maybe. And it's just hard to keep track interesting so the reason i got onto this is because they just showed all of the post um there's a movie there's a new movie coming out like i think it's the 17th version of dune i'm pretty sure they've made a lot of movies and tv shows about but there's tons of movie stars in this one there's like scott brolin is in this and the guy drogo aquaman is in this Mm -hmm. and um my most one of the most underrated actors in the world um what's his name oscar isaacs is is in this like unbelievably underrated actor um so there's tons of movie stars in this movie like this is a so i saw but i saw the posters um and they look so dope that i was like i might i might be able to get behind this and i do a lot of reading now i'm 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 doing this like whole nighttime routine where i read for almost an hour every night before bed and um 
feel good. I feel good, Brad. I was going to say, I feel like that's a good routine to get into. I, mm-hmm. I was My initial question was going to be, at what point do you think you have time to read six ridiculously long Dune novels? Yeah, yeah. But, it's yeah. between 11 and 12. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> that's it. That's my that's my allotted time for, for reading is eleven between 11 and 12. It's good times. Um, but, it, you know, it's part of a whole thing. I'm trying to, you know, be healthy and get in shape and sleep. Hey, speaking of being healthy... Yeah, we got tagged in a tweet like right before we started recording and that I, I didn't even read the article. I probably should have because that would be what a prepared host would do. No, it's good. But like Peloton is getting into yeah, yeah, gaming. Yeah, yeah. I am yeah. in. I don't on the headline. I'm in. I'm I'm in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's awesome. I mean, your Peloton's in the you're in your shot. Like, but, yep, so there we go. People, people who listen to this know that we have video. And if you've been a guest, you know, we have video. But but Brad's Peloton is in his room. Mine's just With on the other side of the door. recently used sweaty rag because I literally got off the Peloton, Gross. saw the tweet, people didn't made dinner, know. and then did the show. Brad, you're disgusting. People didn't need to know that. I'm just too honest for my own good. That's my life So, story. yeah, it's like a, it's like a racetrack. That you're gonna drive down, and it looks like Dune, uh, not Dune. What's the other thing? Tron, the four letter, Tron, another four yep. letter word with a big story. Tron. Tron. Yep. Right. Tron. It looks like Tron, and you're 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 driving, and you're gonna have to ride, and and you're gonna have to like meet certain like cadence and resistance requirements, and you're gonna get prizes and whatever. It's, I don't know, but I need part of this, um, and I'm pretty excited because that's you know that's like. The game based element is what got me into riding in the first place when I was into Zwift mm-hmm. was this idea of of it being a little bit gamified. And actually I find Peloton a lot more gamified than it gives than people give it credit for. Like like there's achievements, tons of achievements, like truckload they are running a masterclass on how to deliver credentials, by the way. Like oh, yeah. if you're looking for like um, a a business source of knowledge and information on how to deliver digital credentials, Peloton. You should be looking into that nonsense because oh my god, there's thousands. And, e- of and them. even from the teaching like standpoint, the the um the like the trainers and instructors like they call out the badges when somebody has them in a class. Like I was, Crazy. I did a, my ride today. I did with Leanne Hainsby, and she commented on how like someone had the Yes for You crew badge, and then I was like, well, wait, now I need that badge because like. <laughs> <laughs> like yes to you all day. I'm, I'm gonna I'm like I don't know how to get that badge, and now I gotta figure it out. So I don't know. Like you're right. They they have it right. They there is like a thing about it where I went, you know, with just life and business and stuff. I went like two months or a month and a half without writing, and it felt wrong. Like mm-hmm. and, and then now I'm back and pushing myself way harder than I would after getting back from a break because I gotta catch back up to where I was. Like I've gotta I gotta get on the leaderboard. I gotta get up there. That's awesome. Yeah, so we're ex- I'm excited about that, um, and and hopefully I can get into the the beta. In in other gaming news, we're not going to talk long about this, but I, I did want to. We're going to put it in the show notes. Um, I was at a on a PAX panel actually with Zach Hartsman, who uh, who was just on the show, and Steve Isaacs. Um, and there is our obligatory name drop. Yep. Um, yeah, for for the show, it crushed the Steve <laughs> Isaacs name drop. Um, but PAX is. Another thing that non-gamers wouldn't know, but PAX is probably like after after E3 and after Gamescom that's in Germany and the Tokyo Game Show, PAX is probably the fourth largest video game conference in the world. It's and it's big. Like like Gamescom and TGS and E3 are gigantic. PAX is gigantic. And they do but they do panels, which is super cool. Almost like um GDC Game Developer Conference also does panels, um, but I was on a PAX panel, which is so cool. Um, kind of bucket list a little bit. Yeah, it is. Um, so, it is very cool. When I saw you were doing that, I was like, okay, I'm I'm super jealous of that one. That yeah, cool. it was pretty rad, and I'm I'm pretty excited. So that's a little check mark on my on my personal resume there. And, like and so context, I have to vod. for for context, like PAX, yeah. like for our audience, right? PAX versus an ISTE, for example. PAX is, is like is like an ISTE. E3 is probably is probably so the thing about E3 is that E3 used to be industry only and it's still very industry, but um, you know, PAX is PAX is like the gamers conference. Like it's 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 a lot less industry focused. It's it's a lot of players 
there's a lot of like demo booths there's a lot of like beta signups there's a lot of but then there's these panels um but the panels in in normal paxes would have been like like comic con pax is a lot like comic con for video games um but like the big comic con what's that san diego or whatever yeah, yeah. right so it's big like so it, it was it's really cool i am we we submitted the same panel which is our game study panel we submitted it for pax west um which is going to be in person in seattle in the fall and i swear to god if we get in i'm going to pax <laughs> um pax prime pax west that's the main pax um so i'm pretty excited i'm pretty psyched about it um you know it's funny this wouldn't be on education if there wasn't games talk we brought in someone else who knows about video games thank god yeah no i and you know you you <laughs> we got we got tagged in a tweet uh, so like, actually you got tagged in it. It's one of those whole, like do this and then tag five people, which, which normally sure. I'm generally disgusted by, like, I just can't stand. But in this particular case, you got tagged in it and played out. And then I actually managed to, to do it myself. But it, the question was the five games that made you the gamer you are today. So, so you said for you, it was a shockingly easy list. So what did, what did you come I'm up with? I've thought about it. I've totally thought about it. And I've talked about it a little bit on the podcast. I wouldn't be a teacher if it was not for civilization. I would not be a teacher. I guarantee you. Um, it got me into history. Um, it got me into, to, you know, thinking critically and deeply about video games and, um, and, and playing hard games and stuff like that. I, so I put, I had Civ 2 and Civ 5 on the list. I probably should have lump them all into like all <laughs> civilizations because i've bought them all and played them all aggressively i think i have like 2500 hours in civilization 5 at this point on steam sounds about right so i mean it's it's bonkers um i did put age of empires on there another history game um and what else did i have in there world of warcraft i actually i got into a really good conversation after this list about when i put world of warcraft on there because um, I actually wrote a paper um, about my my experience as a guild leader in a like a high end rating World of Warcraft guild. Um, and there like, the is, like, there are two experience. kinds of listeners to this show, by the way, and they are defined by their I reaction to that sentence. Yeah, yeah, yeah there, yeah, is, yeah. there is half of the audience that said, I have no idea what three quarters of those <laughs> words meant, and why do I listen to this show? Get me to the interview. Uh, and then there's the other half that are like, yeah, that makes total sense, and I don't need an interview in my life. <laughs> I wrote a paper about it, man. I wrote a paper about leading leading MMO guilds and how it relates to developing leadership skills. And, and how it played a role in leadership skills in education. Like I, I tied all of those <laughs> points together. Um, and I, you know, and one of the omissions that I had a buddy that I tagged in it, um, had wrote Sim City and I probably should have put Sim City in my list. So that's like an honorable mention. I played the hell out of Sim City. Um, I played, you know, Sim City for a ridiculous amount. Um, skipped uh, the newest SimCity was a dumpster fire, the one that came out in 2009. But City Skylines, which has come up on this podcast a lot, and is a great game for education, um, um, is is amazing. It is the best game in that genre. Um, did you did you you wrote a list? I'm not sure if I remember seeing it, and I'm sure it's all Zelda games. So let's go. It's not all Zelda games. I struggled with this list. I'm not gonna lie. I struggled Good. a lot because. Cool. I could probably have put five Zelda games. I also probably could have put five Mario games. And then I realized how much Nintendo was on my list. So I, I struggled with this. And I actually had subtitles, like con comments for each one. And they wouldn't fit in the tweet. So I had to delete them all. But <laughs> um, So I put Zelda Ocarina of Time is number one. That is That made me the gamer I am today. Um, and, and like I 100%. That is that is probably the the definitive answer. I'm I'm literally getting a Triforce with an ocarina tattoo in a month. So like that is that is the game for me. Um, the other one I would put on there, and this is going to get some hate. Final Fantasy VIII, best Final Fantasy game. Wrong. At, at me. Go ahead. At me. I don't care. It's still the best Final Fantasy game. And the game, <laughs> the tweet did not specifically say video game, so I think I cheated a little bit and I put Magic the Gathering, like the original, okay. like that game was. Along the same time I was doing Zelda Ocarina of Time, we were playing Magic the Gathering. 
every single day with my wow. brothers and my friends. I mean, it was, we would be in the like hallways of the apartment buildings and like, cause my parents said we had to go outside. So we would go to the hallways of the apartment buildings, which in Florida, those are outside to be clear. Technically they're not in a building. And so we would just sit there on the floor and like play magic constantly. You were a giant nerd. Oh uh, yeah. Oh, such a nerd. Oh. Um, and then <laughs> I split Mario, Super Mario brothers. I think original Mario, I have memories of my dad playing. Oh, that I love it. I was it. like, three yeah. and like that got me into gaming um and then the last one i had to put was halo i think that was the first time of that whole list that was the first time that like the idea of community gaming sort of came into my life my friends and i would go to one friend's house in particular that was super fancy because his dad was an it guy and he had it set up for a land connection and we'd bring all our xboxes over and play like 15 people in a house and you'd hear people screaming in the other room when you headshot them like it was great it was just awesome experiences so, so funny those are those are my five I, I i stand by them i stand by them interesting i have a very hot take about halo okay that you're not gonna like I mean, go for it. I legitimately guest. think Halo might be the most over, one of the most overrated series of all time. Like, I, I just, I, I don't, I can't get on it, and I, I get, you know, I think what what attaches people to it is that co- that community experience is huge. The idea that it was, it was one of the first games that people played, like, like in that Xbox Live era, right? I don't know, I don't know how into this we want to get, but. I'm going to say <laughs> the best shooter previous to Halo was Goldeneye. Go back and try to play Goldeneye. Yeah, now. no, it's terrible. It is a dumpster fire. Yeah, the yeah, aiming was a nightmare. And yeah. Halo is the game that developed the two stick aim style, which to this day is still how first person shooters work. So regardless of what you may feel about the, the series as a whole or the storyline or the obsession uh. with it, it is still the game that developed how all first person shooters have been played ever since. Just saying. Just say whatever you want. You're wrong. Keep going. This is a great episode of the podcast. <laughs> but for only you and I. That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> so so we came across a, a tweet and this this podcast wouldn't this wouldn't be an episode uh, without a tweet um, that is worth talking about. Um, from Abby Norman. Um, at Abby Norman says uh, is her handle and her tweet is I quit my teaching job and now make more bartending. For 15 less hours a week, I also get blamed for way, way less and get told thank you way, way more. No lesson plans or grading papers. Remember this when people ask about the teacher shortage. And I'll tell you, I've seen a couple of these recently. Um, Eric Leitner um, also tweeted recently about a job posting he saw in Florida for a teaching position that had three years required experience and its pay was twenty to thirty thousand dollars a year, which is mind blowing. Our 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 friend Becky Latov quit her job um, teaching because they were gonna make her work in a death trap of a school. Um, she didn't say that. I said that. You can sue me if you want, stupid Florida school. Um, just for but, the record, I don't have anything against Florida schools in general. I'm, I'm just <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> all me, all me. I'm good. I'm good with it. Come at me. Um, it's like a charter school or whatever, so it just makes it even more obviously ridiculous. Um, but you know, she actually, I think, probably makes more as a consultant for Participate um, than she was going to have to get paid to teach. You know, and you know, be exposed to COVID in like a you know, the wild west of no COVID precautions in Florida. Um, You know, so... What's COVID? I haven't heard of it. (laughs) Right. It's like, huh? Let's just go to the beach, dudes. Um, So I quit my teaching job and now make more bartending. You know, that doesn't surprise me at all. Like, I I mean, I think... Any bartender probably makes more than any teacher. Like a bad bartender at a dive well, bar no. probably makes. In Florida, Obviously let me not. let me clarify. In Florida, okay, okay. Like if, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you are if you are looking at like right around any college in Florida, like any you major university around UCF, for example, the bartenders at UCF make more than the people that graduated with a degree from UCF in education. I I don't doubt that for a second. However. What I found fascinating about this was sort of the replies. Like, some of the replies that came in were pretty great. Like, some people were throwing out 
what salaries were in various areas. And um, one of the top replies was like, I'm in Florida. None of this is true for me. <laughs> like, I would make way more as a bartender than I would as a teacher in Florida. Our starting salary, I don't know where they were making twenty to 30000 but starting salaries in Florida now, thanks to a, a bill by Governor DeSantis that only raised beginning teacher salaries and teachers with experience didn't go up at all. Um, they are like $47,000 a year, I think, is something like that. Maybe forty two, um, But it's like... That's nothing. That that's and, the, and like it's not like the cost of the living in Florida is cheap. That's the average salary. That's starting. That's starting. Starting. We, okay. On a budget, we're charged. We are like for the quote unquote average is like sixty two thousand dollars a year. Which is it's okay, but it's certainly not the wage like a professional with with you know multiple degrees um, and it, it deserves at all. Like I mean, not even close. Um, you know, and if you were, if you were single making 62 grand, isn't bad. Like you're not living an awesome life, but I mean, you're, you're doing okay. But I mean, man, yeah, my, in a one rough. bedroom studio apartment in Orlando and, and a teacher, if you're in downtown now, nah, you can't afford that. But like outside wow, of the yeah. city, like, yeah. yeah, you could do okay. You could do one little, little one bedroom apartment and you might have enough money to go to a bar on a Friday night. Like that's, mm. that seems fair. Yeah. Steady diet of mac and cheese. Yeah, yeah. I mean, solid. It's, like it's great. Microwave <laughs> little mac and cheese dream. is life. That is life. The, 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 and the the irony. I remember feeling this way. By the way, I I'm not kidding about this. I remember feeling this way. I was like, I'm in school, and I remember as a student what it felt to look at teachers like, oh, they've they've got their life together. They like, you know, I may not want to be what they want. They are like whatever, but they're adults. They're teaching me how to live in the world, and sure. yes, they're teaching me all the stuff I don't want to know. And now, and then it was like when I was a single teacher and I was going home to my little like crappy one like two bedroom apartment with the just awful carpets and because that's what i could afford like it was oh yeah no this is what all my teachers went home to actually now that i think about it this is this is it and i definitely respected them which i guess is good but man that is just not it's it's it really is and, and i see it i see it from the other side a little bit now as an ap as an assistant principal like we're trying to hire people and and when you look at what you know what our what our teachers in, are making, but even st- extend it beyond, beyond that, our classified staff, our non-instructional staff, they're making under $15 an hour. And we're sitting here pushing for a $15 an hour minimum wage. And our poor our poor cafeteria staff and our janitors and our, and our people doing the work that is so tremendously necessary to keep a school running are making $10, $12 an hour if they're lucky. Yeah. Like, it's just not okay, man. No. So... We've told, we've said everything that we could possibly say over the last 200 episodes about what people need to do to to resolve or like help resolve this. I mean, it's it's politics, obviously, and it's voting and voting for people who care about education and educators. Um, and and you know that's the only thing that's gonna make any of this kind of stuff change uh so we can only keep you know pounding the that drum and 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 encouraging people to to vote and encourage others to vote and um you know keep doing the work to make sure people know that teachers are professionals and they deserve a a lot more and and it's a shame any any bright capable person you know who decides to quit you know educating uh to go uh, serve drinks um, because they need that to make more. Um, that's a tragedy mm-hmm. um, of of pretty epic proportions, um, and and so it's it's uh, it's untenable. And 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 we do our little part here to try to help fix it, and hopefully other people will uh, get out and vote. Folks. Get out and vote. Take a picture. Take a screenshot of this tweet. It's linked in the show notes. Take a screenshot of this tweet and just post it on your Facebook. See what happens. Like, t- yeah. see what your racist uncle says about this tweet. Because, like, I really want to know what your uncle Bill says. Like, I just want to know. <laughs> yeah, the way in, Bill. Um, <laughs> hey, when we come back, we're going to talk to, I'm a big fan of this guy, Zach Hartsman. So stay with us. We are building this virtual community of educators who share an interest in game design and teaching new skills. We will use this space to connect, to collaborate, and innovate with the Sandbox. That's Sebastian Bourget. He's the co-founder and chief operating officer at the Sandbox. 
This community is here to provide guidance, support, feedback, and suggestions on how to best use the sandbox within the context of teaching and learning how to make video games. It allows also to connect experts and educators, bringing together existing creators and members of the Sandbox game platform community with professional educators. The Sandbox community has grown into a vibrant space of 100 plus educators. How can you get involved? More to come later in the episode. Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. Our guest is a social studies teacher in New York City. He's also the owner and proprietor, I love that word, of Hey Listen Games, which is probably the best repository of K-12 video game curriculum in the world. He's a recipient of the Game Awards Future Class 2020 recognition as well. Welcome to On Education, Zach Hartsman. That was, that was a lot of high praise. No, well, you I'm deserve like ner- it, I'm nervous now. <laughs> no, that's that's it. That's what we do. So talk about uh listen, you know, I give you all that high praise because like and I tell you this all the time. We talk a lot, especially lately, and I tell you all the time that if I had won the Game Awards Future Class 2020 thing, I'd be putting it on banners outside my house and stuff. I'd be screaming. Um, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about the game awards. Let's talk about future class. There's going to be a lot of people in the audience who don't know what that is and why that's a big deal. So tell us what it is, who they recognize and, and, and why, and how it feels to be part of that 2020 group. Yeah. So the game awards is a big like ceremony put on every year, uh, produced and hosted by Jeff Keighley, one of the main faces in the gaming industry. You think it's, you can think it's of huge. it. Yeah. It is the it is the game awards now. Yeah, think of you can think of it as like the Oscars. Um, yeah. just on the game side. Yeah. And this past year in 2020, they started an initiative as a part of the game awards called the Future Class and it's a group of I didn't know it at the time, but it's a group of 50 people um, and I guess each year will be 50 more people. That's that's an assumption for now. But it's 50 people from around the world who are using games in unique ways and just making the industry a more diverse and inclusive space. And I was chosen as one of the first 50 people, um, the inaugural class of the future class. Uh, my wife actually was the one who nominated for me. She told me she was going to nominate for me. And then so nice. I didn't think I was going to get accepted, but then I did. So <laughs> thank you to her. Um, yeah. And it's cool because the when I I didn't know who the other members were until the, uh, the day it was made public. And as I was browsing through them, these were all a lot. Most of them were names of people that I knew um, who work in the gaming industry, either devs or um, personalities or journalists, like a lot of podcast hosts, um, some bigger devs, some a lot of indie developers. But uh, I was a lot of people in accessibility also, but I was really the only person like outside the gaming industry. I like I'm starting to like creep more into it, but I like I'm a teacher. I'm in the educational world. I'm not yeah. like officially part of the gaming industry. Um, and so I was the only teacher as a part of the group. And it's awesome. It's yeah, it's so cool. I'm hoping like going forward, we can get more educators repped in that group because like you, you all know it. Just games in school and education, game based learning is just growing rapidly. So I, I do think it's gonna, we're gonna have a bigger presence soon. Tell me. So you, you mentioned like we hope to see more, right? So, so in your eyes, does this, does this equate to more exposure for games and education, or more exposure for education and games? Like, what does that, what does that mean to you? More exposure for like games being used in an educational space. Because, like, a lot of the work I do is using video games as texts, right? I'm using, I'm often using them as, like, pieces of literature in my class for my students to, like, read and analyze the same way that they do with any other text, any book, any movie, any poem. It's like we're doing the exact same skills, just using a game as an, another, like, variable. Um, and that it's beca- that is becoming more popular, especially since I made Hey, Listen Games. I have teachers reaching out to me all the time about uh, asking for ideas or telling me about 
the lessons from my site that they have used. So I do I do know that it's just that they, in my own like personal sphere, especially on Twitter, like people are contacting me all the time about how they they want to try this and how they are trying this. Um, so I my hope is that it eventually bleeds into the gaming industry and, and game devs start seeing the products that they're making as pieces of literature because when people when authors write books or like poetry a lot of the creators will work work with schools to get their books in the classroom yeah. whereas that's not really a thing yet for games you don't see many game devs trying to get their uh games in classrooms other than a couple of really like big name AAA studios yeah, yeah, like a, I guess Assassin's Creed, that was where uh, I was the, at, yeah. the Discovery Tour is the one I think of. Right. So, so you mentioned Hey Listen Games. So let's talk about that. And and actually, I I think the first thing I'd love to start with is the name, um, because I've actually never asked you about mm. the name, and there's got to be a story of some sort, or I I don't know, maybe not. Maybe you were just drinking one night and we're like, Hey, listen, I got a really good idea. Maybe that's it, and I just I just stepped all over it, but. But tell tell us about the name. Do you have a guess? I, I do for sure. Yeah, I, mean, I think it a, could. It, I, I think the most logical one would be what I just said, which is like, you know, no, something it's, to do it's with a that. It's but... an Ocarina of Time reference. Hey, listen. Yeah. Hey, listen. That's that's obviously Navi. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you Zelda nerds! I'm that's... I'm I'm playing Skyward Sword HD right now. I'm oh like, my like, I paid God. sixty dollars for a ten year old game. I am I'm a nerd. <laughs> I'm a Zelda nerd. So did I. So did I. Also have a tattoo scheduled in August. Just saying. It's good. Oh, nice. Voice done. You you Zelda people are insufferable everywhere. I constantly try to forget the fact that you don't like Zelda games. Like it's just <laughs> like it's it's that one. You know, every friend has that one part of your personality you hate. It's just. <laughs> I've tried so hard, and I want to. I want to be part of the cool kids club so bad. Um, now, have, but I did, just, you, did you try Breath of the Wild? Because it's very different. I tried, every... man. I've tried it twice. I own it. It's, I can pick it up. That's a, it's a completely different genre than most Zelda games. Yeah, I know. I know, and that's the one I should like. Um, anyways, you Zelda people. So, are so just, to get us a little back, a little bit back on track, how does uh, how does that reference to you, to you lead to your own product? Yeah. So when I had, like, I had my website made for the most part, and when I launched the website, there were only ten lessons that I had um, there at the beginning, and I didn't have a name yet. I was just, but I needed a name so that I can get a URL to use, and Originally, I just wanted it to be Hey Listen, and it was just going to be heylisten.org, but some, like, musician website had mm -hmm. it, uh, but it's, like, unused, and they wanted several thousand dollars oh. a year. I'm like, I'm not paying that. So I just added games to the end of it. But I, I landed on Hey Listen because Ocarina of, Ocarina of Time is... It is my favorite game. I credit, I credit Ocarina of Time as the game that made me a gamer. Like, before then, I just played, like, Mario and Goldeneye. But Ocarina of Time is really the game that made me start playing adventure games and getting into the games, the story and like exploration. Because mm. like Mario was fun, but that was like it was fun because it's a platformer. So Ocarina of Time really opened my eyes to what gaming could be. And then I from and I was seven, I think, when Ocarina of Time came out. And I talk about this a lot now. How Ocarina of Time was really like I learned a lot from that game. I learned there was a ton of reading. There's a lot of cooperation because I played it with my older brother. We played it together on one save file, taking turns. And this was also before we really had like guides readily available. I, we, I could, we could have gone to the store and bought the physical guide, but I didn't have that. And this was still like in GameFAQs infancy. So, and it was like GameFAQs was just like super small lines of text. So it was like hard to navigate right. that. So when we were playing this, we would actually go to school and talk constantly in the cafeteria with other friends who were playing Ocarina of Time. It was a whole community experience. And that's like part of the magic of video games. You, you learn so much. We work together so much. And Ocarina of Time was really the first game that I started doing all these other aspects rather than just like trying to beat a level. And I've also yelled at my students, hey, listen, a million times. So I thought it was fitting. <laughs> that's awesome. So I think it'd be interesting to chat uh, a little bit about your process. So, you know, let's let's pretend there's a game, um, fictional game, that you uh, see or play or you hear about, and it looks like it has classroom potential. Um, I'm curious, how do you decide whether it does or not? 
And what are you what are you looking for? Like when you're playing a game for the first time, what are you what are you looking for in that first playthrough? So it really depends because often I play so many games that I'd say 80% of the time I'm not looking for a game that could have classroom potential. Mm. It's just the game that I want to play. And as I'm playing, and I'm just playing it for fun. And as I'm playing with it, I'm like, this could work in the in this way. And then at some point, I'll find a way to bring it into my classroom. And then as my website's gotten more popular, I'm now like that other 20%. Now I'm reaching out to developers and asking uh, for code. So like I'm currently playing through Beyond Blue for the first time, made by Eli Media. They also did Never Alone. They're two really great games where they incorporate like live documentaries into the game. And so that, so with Beyond Blue that I'm playing right now, I reached out to them, they gave me a code and now I'm playing it specifically like with creating like a marine bio lesson in mind. Oh, nice. So it, that's a different process than like when I played Celeste for the first time, that was just because I wanted to play Celeste. I heard a lot of great things about Celeste, but then as I was playing it, I thought this would be a really fantastic game to bring into my advisory class to teach about growth mindset and like fail and why it's okay to fail and just trying again. So it really it really depends. I'm often not like searching for a game to bring in. It just kind of happens naturally. So you've played it and you love it. Um, what's next? So how do you go from seeing, you know, the potential in a game uh, that you've played to developing lessons? Or in some cases, like I know, like you've developed entire units. So, yeah. so how do you get from you know smashing the buttons and just playing a game and to to writing lesson plans and publishing them on your website? So when I most of hey lesson games are like individual activities, individual lessons. There there are a couple of units, but I'll I'll get to that a little later. The lessons are more here's something you can bring into your classroom that doesn't need to replace what you're already doing Uh, because when you start developing an entire unit you're going to be sacrificing something in order to teach that because a unit can go from 10 20 30 days Uh, whereas a lot of the lessons i do with games are often a week max i tend they tend to be indie games like two to five hours long just so that they don't take up too much class time so when i find a game that i like so I will use Gone Home, for example, because I use it almost every single year. And when I played Gone Home, I thought this would be a really cool as... Okay, mild spoilers for Gone Home. So in Gone Home, it deals <laughs> with LGBTQ plus issues um, around uh, one of the, the main character of the game, Sam, a teenager in high school. And I feel the way that that game approaches her identity comes is really well done, and it comes out very naturally. And I thought that would be a really great way to introduce that unit. Well, not a full unit, but I was a unit on civil rights and talking about LGBTQ plus people as a part of that. I thought that game was a really great way to introduce my students into that topic. So so once I played the game, I was like, okay, this will be my piece of, because whenever I teach a unit, I'm going to find one piece of literature to bring in. Not everything needs to be primary resources. So that was the game. It only takes about two, two and a half hours. So I put together a quick lesson just going over like what are the struggles of teenagers and then once they get to the point where it is revealed that sam is gay then we get into conversations what are the struggles of being gay where are the struggles of being gay in the 90s during the don't ask don't tell era and it just it leads to a lot of really great conversation and then we branch into a much larger unit yeah you know my my follow-up is uh, like I, w- I was thinking about it before you even answered that question was really about like pushback and, and you know it's one of those things where I, I wanted to incorporate more games into my own classroom before I, I stepped out of the classroom but it, it it was first of all just the like technical limitations of trying to do it with many students and, I, and I've seen from you that you can you know demonstrate it at the front of the board and have a conversation as if they're watching it so I've seen a lot of those things you've done before but I, I can imagine myself or or a lot of other teachers trying to put this in their classroom and getting heavy pushback from administrators and also from parents. You know, as as a parent, we worry about screen time with our kids and not that I necessarily do, but a lot of parents do. Um, But like, um, you know, we worry about screen time with our kids and then that's happening in school now. And then with parent, with admin, wait, what about the standards? You got to teach the standards. You got to teach the standards. How do you, how do you come back at that or, or discuss that with people? Yeah. So, the first thing I always say to people 
who like generally think they will get a lot a lot of pushback from admin or parents is to maybe start off with like a video game club before you start bringing it into your classroom just to kind of set the, like create that culture first right and show its value and then like kind of like baby steps and then you can bring it into your classroom over time because i i did start with a video game club my first two years i didn't really start using games in my classroom until about my third year of teaching uh, in terms of pushback on my end i haven't had any so it's hard for me to talk on that when when i started teaching i immediately like right off the bat started using comics uh graphic novels movies and television and those lessons and units always weren't really well so my and my principal's super supportive in every wacky idea i have so when i originally broached the idea of bringing in video games the only thing she asked was to see the lesson plan and what standards and outcomes i was hitting and this is this is actually what started leading into me making all of the lesson plans that are now on hey listen games because she wouldn't let me teach with them unless i had these full lesson plans mapped out sure so good. i started making them and then after a while i had a bunch of them so i just and people were asking me about it so i made them public so my admin's been nothing but supportive and when it comes to parents i'm in a bit of a unique situation uh the school i teach at it's a public high school but it's an international school for newly arrived immigrants and english language learners so my students are 100 percent immigrant population none of them um, are native English speakers. They're all mo bilingual or multilingual now. And they come here, and as long as they're under 21, they're, they start high school over in ninth grade. So I, like, I, my, my joke is always, in my first year teaching at 23, I had a 22-year-old in my classroom. And <laughs> the nature of them being immigrants and emergent bilinguals, multilinguals, their parents have trusted me to do anything I've ever wanted. They're just like, you're teaching my kid English. I don't even like they're just like you do, do whatever you think is best so I've I've never once gotten pushback from any of them but that's a, it's so, a unique situation awesome so so I live in southern Ontario and you live in New York City two of the most socially liberal places in the entire world probably so let's talk about the other part of this which is you teaching games about LGBTQ issues about racism, about, and, and, and I'm all for it, but Brad lives in <laughs> Florida. Oh no. And I don't need to say more <laughs> about that. And, you know, and we have friends and listeners in, you know, all over the, all over the place who are saying, I couldn't teach games, let alone teach gone home in my classroom. What it, you've got to have some 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 thoughts, some guidance, hopefully for our friends um, that aren't in you know liberal bastions of the world. Yeah. Um, so you don't need to use "Gone Home" as a text, although I think you should. Like "Gone Home" is always like my required reading for anyone. But I did last year actually. I I helped a teacher in Texas uh, put together a unit on using "What Remains of Edith Finch" and. And she she teaches uh, middle school students, and it went fantastically with her. And that's like that's not a political game by any means. It's just a wonderful short story. And there are thousands of those. There's so many indie games that are just tell really great stories that, that like don't need to be political, quote unquote. Although like I prefer to use the political games because I think those lead to more interesting conversations. Um, but if you just want to teach about literary elements or rhetorical devices, just like the stuff that you see in standardized tests, there there are games for that also. So the only thing you would need to do is just show the value of the game to your school or to the parents or to your students. So you're saying don't just do it first and ask for forgiveness if you find yourself like somewhere in a flyover state. Like if just you don't. have a union, yes, do it first and ask for forgiveness. But if you don't have a union, I... then and it's you can get fired. Then I'm not so sure. I have a wonderful union that will protect me no matter what so it's that's tough <laughs> i i love i love that you use the term flyover state because i say that all the time and i'm the one who gets in trouble well, by saying that north dakota has no pop people um, now there's anyway, two of us brad said now there's it. Brad two of us said it. <laughs> brad said it this time just for the record uh <laughs> so well, i i i just i want to know like you know what what is in your eyes what's the future of hayless and games i mean you're doing awesome stuff i i think it's safe to say that the work you're doing is impacting classrooms in a large space i mean we've seen it ourselves but like what is what is kind of the future of hayless and games i don't know i know what mike wants it to be 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> Mike wants everything to be more work we've, on everyone. He just wants other people to suffer as much as he does. <laughs> we've talked about this. Yeah. This is a great question. What's the future of Hey Listen Games? Yeah. Set? So when when I made Hey Listen, it was never meant to be the thing that like generates income for me. It was just the way. It was originally just a way to share what I have. And I haven't said it yet, but like all the lessons, all the curriculum on Hey Listen Games are free. There, I don't I don't charge. I morally against charging teachers to pay um, for curriculum because I've never had to do it and. I'm in New York, I get paid decent, but like most teachers don't get paid decent salaries. So I just like hate asking teachers to pay for anything. You can't donate. There are options to donate, which a lot of teachers have donated like small amounts here and there, which is great. So originally it was just meant to be a way to like showcase what I was doing. I had, before I had launched it, I had spoken to my wife about how I was interested in blogging um, or trying to get into blogging. So like part of Hey Listen Games is the curriculum side and then part of it is a blog where whenever I do put a a new lesson, I'll provide a full post explaining my rationale for this game. Or whenever I teach with a game in my class, I'll talk about how it went with my students and put some like handouts and student samples. Um, so there's like those two parts of it. But it's, as it's gotten more popular, it's, I'm now like my hope is that it leads to opportunities in other areas. So I'm currently in the process of publishing a teaching manual on teaching with video games. It's currently in like its interior design phases. This has been like a year and a half in the making, tons of editing and revi revision because I can't write at all. I'm a terrible writer, so it takes a lot of time to get it to like actually look professional. So it's starting and then like ideally it could also lead to contracted work elsewhere with game dev studios who might want a uh, curriculum made for their games. It could like now I'm a known quantity, so maybe it could hopefully lead to these other opportunities elsewhere. But the website itself I don't think we're ever, ever actually like generate in like I have Patreon, but right now that's just for about 40 bucks a month, which is great. That pays for the uh keeps the URL of my URL and my the professional email alive. So ideally, right, it'll lead to opportunities elsewhere. I've also never, when I went into teaching, I was also of the mindset that I don't necessarily want to teach forever. Currently, I have student loans, so I'm in the public loan forgiveness program. So my current goal is to last the 10 years, um, get all my loans wiped out, and then kind of see where I go from there. I think like dream job would be for a big a AAA studio to like hire me as an educational advisor, educational consultant, or just like someone there to make curriculum for them or to work with them to get their games in school spaces. But that's still a couple of years away. So where where can people connect with you? Where can they learn more about you? Uh, share the URL for the website again, and and um, damn it, man, share that Patreon yeah. uh, so so that you can. I'm a, I'm a patron uh, of Zach's just. For disclosure, even though I think that everyone should be, so so tell them where to go to do that as well. Yes, so the website is heylistengames.org or .com. Either will get you there. I'm most active on Twitter. I'm at heylistengames mm -hmm. underscore. Don't forget the underscore at the <laughs> end. I'm so close to getting it, the name without the underscore. Nice. Um, but for now, it, it still has the underscore. So heylistengames underscore. Uh, follow me. Reach out to me. I usually follow back if you engage with me at all, and I'll definitely respond to any direct messages. My Patreon is patreon.com slash games. Yeah, please support. There's a $1 tier level, so if you have a dollar to spare, please throw it my way. Or if you want to buy me a cup <laughs> of coffee, Zach throw $3 my way so I can get some coffee. Buy, buy Zach a coffee. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right, Zach Hartsman, everybody. Thanks for joining us on the podcast, man. Thank you. The Sandbox is creating a learning ecosystem where educators can learn in weekly streams, bring ideas into their classrooms, collaborate with other educators, and become Sandbox ambassadors. Our goal for the stream is to show the world how low the barrier can be to teaching and learning game making through our no-code and accessible platform. Anyone can do it. Passion and education. You can feel it in the streams as we explore and share ideas around game design implementation in your teaching practice. Join the community to learn more at go.participate.com slash sandbox. Thanks for listening to On Education. My name is Brad Shuffler. My co-hosts are Mike Washburn and Glenn Irvin. On Education is part of the On Podcast Media Network. You can listen to this show and many others by great educators like Monica Burns, Mike Matera, Tisha Richmond, and many more by visiting onpodcastmedia.com. Want to get in touch with us? Check out our website at oneducationpodcast.com. You can tweet us at oneducationpod. Mike is Mr. Washburn on Twitter. Glenn can be found on Twitter at Herb Spanish. And I can be found at Brad Streffler. 
You can find us on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash oneducationpod. We're also on Instagram at oneducationpod. If you're enjoying the show and think others would too, we would be thrilled if you would share it with them. Please leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts. When you leave a rating, it gives our rankings a boost. This helps others discover the show. We want to thank our presenting sponsor, Participate, for supporting us. Check out participate.com to learn more about them. Thanks as always for listening. Stay awesome and see you soon.